Hey, my name is Matt Johnson, and this is the brand new Sony ZV-E1 camera that was very recently announced. And in this video, I'm going to be reviewing this camera from the perspective of a wedding filmmaker and telling you if it's a good purchase for you, if you film weddings or documentaries or other fast filmmaking scenarios where you need to be able to record as quickly as possible and you don't want to miss the shot. So starting off before I jump into telling you details about this camera, I want you to know this video is not paid or sponsored by Sony. I am recording this from a hotel room at Sony Camera Camp in San Diego where me and a ton of other YouTubers and TikTokers and Instagrammers and a lot of other people are all hanging out right now. It's a lot of fun and we're all getting to play with this camera and I said, you know what? I have some thoughts about this camera and a lot of people have been asking me, hey, is it good for weddings? Should I buy it for weddings? Should I pre-order it? So let's talk about that. To sort of spoil the conclusion of this review ahead of time because I respect your time like that, I gotta tell you that this camera feels like Sony took a Ferrari engine and crammed it into a Honda Civic. And what I mean by that is that Sony took the super powerful sensor from the a7S III and FX3 and said, what if we put it into a much more compact body and stripped away a lot of the features and put a big exhaust on it? No, okay, that's just more of the Honda Civic reference there. Um, So with that, this camera is incredibly powerful, but it is also incredibly compromised, especially if you are filming weddings or documentaries or other professional work. So that's what we need to talk about. Starting off then, whenever I first saw this camera, I was super excited because I get so many messages from filmmakers saying, hey, I really want to get a full frame Sony camera. I really want an A7S III or an FX3, but I can't pony up the $3,500 that I need to buy one of those cameras. And so then suddenly I see the ZV-E1 and it is offering you a ton of the power of those more expensive cameras. But spoiler, this camera only cost $2,200, which is pretty darn fantastic. And so with this camera on the spec sheet, it reads a lot like an A7S III. You're getting the same 12 megapixel sensor with crazy good low light all the way up to ISO 409,000. Nuts. You are getting the same dual native ISO at 640 and 12,800. So this camera is a total low light beast. You're getting 4K at up to 60 frames per second. And in a firmware update coming later this year, Sony says they will be adding 4K at 120, which is kind of weird because the A7S3 already has it. So you know the sensor can do it. But they're like, hey, we're going to hold off on that. We're going to wait on the 4K 120. The reason which to be determined why that is, we'll talk about here in a minute. Otherwise though, you're getting a lot of the other features that you would expect from the A7S III or FX3. It has S-Log3, it records 10-bit video. This camera also has S-Cinetone, which is great if you want beautiful looking images straight out of camera. I love S-Cinetone as a picture profile, especially if you're doing live streaming, for example. S-Cinetone is really great. Another feature that the ZV-E1 has taken from Sony's other higher-end cameras is the addition of the AI chip that we saw in the Sony A7R5. That is now in this much cheaper camera. And with that, you are getting things like motion estimation, where it is analyzing body parts and telling exactly where they are. And this can really help your autofocus. It's kind of scary. Just like with the A7R5, if somebody's facing away from you, the camera still knows where they are. It knows where their head is, so it can focus on them. It's a pretty stellar camera camera. The internals of this camera are super good. Like I said, going back to that Ferrari versus Civic reference, they've taken the Ferrari engine, aka the sensor of the A7S III, which is stellar, and they crammed it into a smaller body and stripped away a lot of the features. So there's no EVF, you notice. You can't look through it. I remember whenever I was setting up this camera, I was like, okay, I got to put my hand back here because I'm always testing to see where the EVF sensor is because I always want to disable that. And then I was like, wait, there is... There is no EVF. Okay then, my bad. <laughs> and then about 15 minutes after I'm setting up the camera, a Sony employee comes up to me and is like, hey, what do you think of the camera? And I'm like, I'm still in the menus. Give me a second because I'm sure as you're aware, I have a lot of videos about how to customize your Sony cameras so they work as fast as possible. And this camera has a ton of buttons just like every other Sony camera. And there's a lot of customization that you have to do to really get it dialed in and I needed to do that. Now that we've talked about the Ferrari aspect of the camera in regards to the internals being really powerful, we need to talk about the Civic aspect. And here's where the camera starts to falter a little bit in comparison to the A7S III and FX3 because Sony did have to cut some things to be able to hit that $2,200 price tag. And so the first thing that you are going to notice, aside from the lack of EVF, is right over here, 
This camera only has one SD card slot. Yes, sorry about that, but you are not going to get dual SD card recording. You get one SD card recording. And this is not one of those combo SD card CF Express type A card slots either. This is this is just an SD card slot. And uh, yeah, that's all you get. But as a plus, the card does face you whenever you put it in, which is different than the A7S III. So I'm like, oh, look, the card feels like it should go in that way. That's nice. Close it up on the door. Notice it's also on the left side. How weird is that? All the other times, it's always on the right side, but not this time. Someone's like, hey, we put it on the left. Cool. You cool with that? And I'm like, all right, cool. Whatever. Otherwise, I still get a microphone in jack and the top hot shoe mount that what is different from the other ZV cameras that Sony has released is that this hot shoe mount is a active hot shoe, meaning that you can connect one of Sony's ECM B1M mics, for example, and use it for digital audio and it works really well. But that said, this camera also has a built-in internal microphone from the other ZV cameras and they've made some improvements to it, including the ability to change the directionality of the built-in microphone. You can have it be forward or backwards, or you can have it omni recording, and you can even have the camera automatically decide what it wants to be focused on, which is pretty neat overall. And from my testing, it sounds pretty good. Back to things they're stripping though. Uh, yeah, the full-size HDMI port is now gone, and in its place, you get a cute little micro HDMI. Is that micro or mini? I think it's micro. That has to be micro. It's super tiny. Okay, and it's a little janky, okay? And that's not any knock on Sony, that's just a knock on micro HDMI as a whole. If you want to use micro HDMI with this camera, considering just what a flimsy connector that is, would highly recommend purchasing a cage. I'm sure there will be cages available for this camera. Buy a cage to protect that cable connector because the last thing I want to see happen is your cable get broken because it is such a small and fragile connection. One thing that I'm pleased to tell you though is that in regards to battery, this camera is compact, but Sony still managed to fit their full size NPFZ100 battery inside it. So you're getting stellar battery life with it. Very glad to see that because as I said, this camera has the A7S III sensor, so you know it's gonna be sucking down power whenever you're recording that high frame rate footage at 4K 60 frames per second. More on that 4K 60 in a little bit. Now there are some other cool features that Sony has added to this camera that are super compelling, especially for professional filmmaking. And one of the most interesting to me is the addition of a thing called dynamic active image stabilization. Ever since the A7S II, Sony has had in-body image stabilization in their cameras, IBIS. And with the A7S III, Sony introduced active image stabilization where it would crop in on the sensor just slightly and then it would do some technical magic to make the footage even smoother. Well, the ZV-E1 has added a feature called dynamic active image stabilization and this is freaking incredible. The way that it works is that Sony has a technology they call clear image zoom. I've made videos about it in the past where essentially you can zoom in with your camera up to 1.5 times in 4K with essentially no loss in quality. It's kind of nuts. Granted, there are some caveats there. If you're at a very high ISO and you use clear image zoom, it is going to make the footage a bit noisier. So you'll want to be careful with that because you're essentially zooming down the sensor and that can make the noise be more extreme. Also, in the past, whenever you use clear image zoom, you would lose the ability to have eye detect autofocus because the camera was essentially zooming in on the sensor and it was like, I can't do eye detect while it's zoomed in. Ah. But that has changed with the ZV-E1 and this really excites me for future Sony cameras because they have added a feature called dynamic active image stabilization. We're just adding words to this, I know, but dynamic active image stabilization. And with that, the camera is essentially using the power of clear image zoom to zoom in on a 4K image losslessly, so it's not losing any quality, but it's using that zoom ability to stabilize the footage even more. So you're gonna see a more extreme crop. Maybe it's 1.3 times, for example. But with that, the footage gets dramatically smoother. And unlike the Panasonic S5 II, for example, or Canon R5, you're not gonna see the wibbly wobbly corners that you oftentimes get with IBIS on those cameras where you can tell the sensor's really working to keep things stable if you're walking. No, because clear image zoom is zooming in so much, it's not giving you those wobbly edges. This is super exciting to think about Sony adding this to other cameras and other features. It's just really, really impressive and yeah, I like it 
a lot. And I'm already thinking, dang, imagine filming a wedding and not needing to bring a gimbal because you're just handheld and you're getting all these cool shots and you're just swapping things out. Us wedding videographers, we could look like the photographer, just a camera and a lens. What? That'd be crazy, right? The photographer's like, wow, you didn't bring all this stuff. Just kidding. You still brought a ton of audio gear, but you know, it's still cool to think about. I love traveling light. I want to travel as light as possible. This camera can enable you to do that. It's pretty darn impressive. Another new feature Sony has added to this camera is a mode called intelligent auto. And this unlocks a lot of really cool features, but as the name implies, it does use the word auto. And generally auto has been sort of a bad word in the professional filmmaking circles, right? I know that I've made tutorials and I'm like, turn everything off auto. You want manual everything. You want it all to be manual. But in this case, the auto modes are really impressive because I haven't seen anybody doing anything like this. So for example, one of the auto features is that you can have the camera filming you on camera, for example, and it's going to be at say F 1.4. But then if someone else steps into the frame that you want to also have in the video, the camera will detect there's another person. It's going to automatically dial down the aperture and bring up the ISO. So the image stays the same exposure, but it changes the depth of field so the other person with you is also in focus. I remember that I've done vlogging style setups before where I was filming myself and somebody else was in the frame and it was just hard to make sure the camera focused on both of us. And with this intelligent auto mode, it just works. It's kind of cool. Granted that said, it is an auto mode so you gotta trust the camera a little bit, but these cameras are getting smarter and it's pretty darn impressive. Another super cool feature of this intelligent auto mode is that Sony has added the ability for the camera to use that clear image zoom power also and reframe the footage. And so you, if you have the camera on a tripod, you can have it focused on you and the camera will actually zoom in on you and track you around the frame as you move. And so this unlocks a lot of cool features because if you are filming yourself on a tripod, the camera will follow you. So that could be really useful if you are filming yourself talking. Or if you are filming on a gimbal, you can tell the camera to make sure that it keeps you in the frame and it's going to help keep you centered by using the clear image zoom technology and the intelligent auto modes to essentially keep you centered in frame and make your footage look a lot better. So I don't know how useful that's going to be for wedding filmmakers or documentary work, etc. But I do think that's really cool that Sony's adding new features like this that we didn't even ask for, but I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Would I use that in a situation? Maybe I would. And one nice thing, speaking of that ability for the camera to zoom in and crop and reframe in camera, what's nice is that if you're using an external recorder, you can have the camera set up where it will record to the camera the zoomed in footage, but you can also have the external recorder recording a fully uncropped wide view of you as well for you to be able to crop it in in post as you need to also, which is pretty neat. I personally would love to see something like where cameras that have dual SD card slots, maybe one SD card could record the cropped footage and the other SD card could record the wide uncropped footage. Like the camera already is capable of doing that if you're running it out to an external recorder. I don't know if that would affect overheating too much or something like that. This camera doesn't have dual SD card slots, so that's not possible, but something like that could be really cool to see happen. Now all this said, at this point here, we've talked about all of the features that Sony has crammed into the ZV-E1. We've talked all about the Ferrari engine of the sensor that they've crammed into this much smaller Honda Civic type body. Now we have the last thing to talk about though, and this is the big red flag about the ZV-E1. And just like with cramming a high-end sports car engine into a tiny car, there's gonna be compromises. And whereas some of those compromises were pretty obvious, like, oh, there's only one SD card slot and there's micro HDMI. Very obvious, you open up a flap and you can see that. The less obvious compromise with the ZV-E1 is going to come from the sensor being used in this much smaller body, and I'm sure you can guess where I'm going with this. We need to talk about overheating with the ZV-E1. For context, I love what Sony has done with the A7S III and FX3, where with the A7S III, it has an internal heat dissipation, sigma-shaped graphite cooling system. It's really crazy. The point is that I've done testing on the a7S III and it is incredibly hard to make that camera overheat. If you haven't watched my overheating video, I'll link it to it in the corner and down in the video description. And then with cameras like the FX3 and FX30, Sony was like, hey, we added a fan. You don't got to worry about overheating anymore. Awesome. Love that. Look at this camera. Do you see a fan on it anywhere? No. 
there is no fan at all. And so if we're talking about compromises, this is the biggest compromise of all. To be clear, I've only had this camera for a day and I am in San Diego, California, which is usually bright and sunny, optimal testing conditions for overheating. But in this case, it's been rainy yesterday and it's supposed to be rainy today and it's in like the 50s and yeah, um, not been as easy to test the overheating. That said though, Sony has been very upfront that this camera should be able to record for quite a while if you are recording indoors in an air conditioned 72 degrees Fahrenheit environment. But where I am concerned about the ZV-E1 is what happens if you take it outside of that air conditioned environment. Like for example, say you are filming a wedding outdoors in Texas. That is where this camera really starts to falter, and that is arguably the biggest compromise that I see for this camera for wedding filmmakers and documentary filmmakers, run and gun filmmakers, etc. While I have not personally experienced this, I am hearing anecdotes from other people that have had a chance to test the camera. People like Dan Watson, who runs a fantastic YouTube channel, I'll link to him down in the description. I was watching one of his Insta stories that he just posted about filming with this camera, and he said that he was in Florida, which, hey, Florida, just like Texas, hot and humid. He was outside, it was about 85 degrees, and he was filming in direct sunlight, and in 4K60, this camera overheated for him in five minutes. I've spoken to other people that tested this camera in advance in places like Mexico, and also roughly 85 degrees Fahrenheit, camera overheated in five to 10 minutes. So here's my initial review of the ZV-E1 after having used it for the past day and hearing those anecdotes from other filmmakers that have had it overheat. If you are a wedding filmmaker or documentary filmmaker and you've been looking for a good quality camera and you've been saying, hey, like I love the FX3, I love the A7S3, but I can't afford that $3,500 price tag. Oh, Sony just announced the ZV-E1. We're cramming the A7S III sensor into this body for only 2200 bucks. Wow, what a deal, right? And I agree, it is a deal if you are filming things that will enable you to use this camera to its fullest capabilities without it overheating. And so if you film weddings or documentaries or other run and gun events that are one take events where you have to get things right and overheating would essentially destroy your ability to do that, the ZV-E1 is not for you. I would not recommend this camera because it's just too risky from an overheating perspective. I personally love the features that they've crammed into this camera. And I love that they've made the A7S III sensor accessible at a cheaper price point. But my first thought whenever I saw this camera was, oh my gosh, this could be a great B camera or a C camera. You could set up this camera to film a wedding ceremony and just have it in the back. It's gonna record a great angle. Only 2200 bucks, that's great. But the overheating is a big red flag. And especially if I was filming with this camera and I had it unmanned and I was not able to see if it was overheating or not, whenever you consider that it does not have dual SD card slots as well, it's very hard for me to recommend the ZV-E1 for wedding filmmaking. That said though, if you primarily film talking head videos or YouTube videos, especially if you are indoors, like I am in a nice air conditioned hotel room right now, in that situation, I think that a camera like the ZV-E1 makes a lot of sense because you're in an air conditioned environment. You can record for quite a long time in 4K at 24 FPS or 4K at 60, or probably even a little bit at 4K at 120 whenever they release that as a firmware update. I think in those situations, you would be perfectly fine. But if you are filming weddings, one take events where you have to get it right, can't recommend the ZV-E1 right now. That said though, I am super excited about the technology they've added to this to maybe be added to an A7S IV in the future or another future camera that will be good for wedding filmmakers. And if you're sad right now and you're telling me, dang it, Matt, like I was really hoping I could get this camera, what should I buy? Go watch my Sony FX30 review because with that camera, it's 1800 bucks, so it's $400 cheaper than this camera and you are getting dual SD card recording and a built-in fan so it's not gonna overheat. You're not getting the super powerful, amazing A7S III sensor, but you're also not going to deal with overheating either. And I think in a professional context, having a camera that is incredibly reliable, that's going to last throughout whatever you're filming, that's what you're really going to want. With that, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, if you're a wedding filmmaker, which I assume you probably are considering this as a video for 
wedding filmmakers. I would love to help you out even more. So I've put together a guide called YouTube Tips for Wedding Filmmakers. And this guide is going to walk you through some steps you can take to get more views, likes, and bookings through YouTube, which come on, everybody wants more bookings totally. So if you want to check that out, I will link to it down in the video description. It's completely for free. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.